please welcome President Cruz to the stage. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Herbert H. Lehman College of the City University of New York, the most important mission-critical senior college of the world's greatest urban university. Thank you for being here for the 48th annual Herbert H. Lehman Memorial Lecture. First, I would like to express my appreciation to several special guests for their attendance. Please join me in thanking Council Member Andrew Cohen, New York State Senator Gustavo Rivera, Assemblyman Victor Pichardo, and from the Mayor's Office and our esteemed City University of New York Board of Trustee Member Lorraine Cortez Vasquez. On behalf of Lehman College, I would like to express gratitude for your support. Now, please allow me to remind everyone here that the namesake of our college, Herbert H. Lehman, was a successful businessman, governor of New York State, and then a U.S. Senator. He was also a much admired leader, possessing integrity of the highest order, who fought for equity and humanitarian values. In fact, he was often referred to as the conscience of the United States Senate. We would do well to have him here with us today. Today's speaker, the Honorable Adriano Espaillat, a United States Congressman representing the 13th Congressional District here in the state of New York, could be referred to as the conscience of the U.S. House of Representatives. But after only four months and two days of service, perhaps this sobriquet would be premature although not out of line. As the country's first Dominican American member of Congress and one of two members to have formerly lived as an undocumented immigrant in the United States, Congressman Espaillat has direct empathetic understanding of what it's like to be in this country today under threat of deportation, an understanding of leaving your homeland and striving to make a better life in a foreign land with the only things in your favor being your determination and courage and ability to work harder than humanly possible. The strange, unsettled state of mind where you are fearful while exuding fearlessness. Helping others is in his DNA. And after his grandmother's tutelage, he advanced to the New York City Criminal Justice Agency, the Coalition for Community Concerns, the New York State Assembly, and the New York State Senate. At heart, he is still a community organizer, and I'm sure he will be the rare progressive Democrat who goes to Washington and remains a progressive Democrat. <laughs> Today, Congressman Espaillat represents the most densely populated congressional district in the United States. It includes Northern Manhattan and the part of the West Bronx where Lehman College is located. He is our congressman. In his lifetime, he has seen this great representation of the world that we call New York City grow to eight and a half million people, more than half of them foreign born or here since the year 2000. These new Americans deserve a congressman committed to equity driven policies for all Americans. And that is where Congressman Espaillat fits in. I could tell you more about Congressman Espaillat's remarkable journey, its significance, and the work that is ahead for him, but I won't, because like all of you, I would rather hear it from him. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming to the lectern the Honorable U.S. Congressman from New York's 13th District, Adriano Espaillat. Thank you. Good morning. And thank you, President Cruz, uh, for your warm introduction. President Cruz uh, visited uh, Washington. Uh, he testified before the Education and Workforce Development Committee, which I am a member. Uh, 
when we took up issues regarding our student loans, student loans continue to be a major, major hurdle for young families, for uh, recently graduated students. Uh, recently, I would say in the last five years, uh, student loans overpassed credit card debt across the country. Let me tell you again, M students own more money for their education than Americans own to their credit cards. And many people are perpetually in debt, meaning that by the time they overcome their student loan debt, their children kick it. And so we must do better for our students. And President Cruz uh, was an eloquent voice in bringing forward to the US Congress uh, some real uh, suggestions, some real life uh, suggestions that will ma make it better for all of us in that arena. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the distinguished members of the board, administrators, faculty, students, guests that are here today, including three of my colleagues in government, Senator Rivera, Assemblyman Pichardo, and Council Member Andy Cohen as well as the distinguished uh, trustee for CUNY University, Lorraine Cortez Vasquez. Uh, we thank you all for being here. It has been um, a real uh, experience in the last 100 days. Uh, indeed, uh, a roller coaster ride, if you may. But it is an honor to be here to deliver this um, speech, this lecture. I know that in the past, uh, many distinguished New Yorkers and, and world leaders have been here. So for me, uh, the son, of, the, the grandson of factory workers, uh, it's, it's indeed a, a privilege to be standing here, President Cruz. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, this college bears the name of a former governor and a former member of Congress, Herbert Lehman. Uh, it stands in the northern part of the Congressional District, a very diverse district that was restructured uh, after the 210 census, that now has Albanian Americans in Norwood. It has West African in parts of the Bronx uh, part of the district. It has, uh, obviously, a significant number of Puerto Ricans, both in the Bronx and in East Harlem, Mexicans, in East Harlem, you have even Vietnamese in the University Heights area. You have Russian Jews in Washington Heights and Dominicans in Washington Heights. You have Senegalese immigrants on 116th Street. And you have the iconic capital of the black experience in America, Harlem, and the cradle of the Latino emergence in our country, El Barrio. So this is a dynamic an iconic district represented in the last 75 years by only two members of Congress. The late and great Adam Clayton Powell Jr. who chair the committee, Mr. President, where you testified, the Education and Workforce Development Committee, where he was a legend. In fact, he passed in four years over 50 pieces of legislation that are now an integral part of the social services safety net of America. He took a session of Congress to 125th Street. A great man whose a great speech uh, before his congregation at the Abyssinian Baptist Church highlighted the human spirit when he asked everybody, what's in your hand? What do you have in your hand? David had a slingshot and slayed Goliath and delivered a great victory to his people. Moses had a stick in his hand and opened up the Red Sea so his people could go to freedom. Christ, two nails in his hand and he split history in half. Before Christ and after Christ, what do you have in your hand? The power of your vote. And so that's what he said. This was a great man, uh, the late and great and Clayton Powell. And of course, for the last 46 years, it was represented by the line of Lenox Avenue, Charles B. Rangel, who in his own right 
with his pizzazz and his ability to build coalition and convince people brought much needed resources uh, to that uh, district. So I am privileged to be the third member to represent that district. And I bring uh, to it my own story, uh, which I consider to be an American story. And so I'm happy to be here at Her Herbert Lehman College because he stood for the common good and believed that the role and responsibility of government was to look after the least among us. And that, that in fact, the most vulnerable among us are children, seniors, the poor, disabled, and victims of oppression. We will be judged as a society in the future, not just by how well we're doing in Wall Street, not just by what kind of windfall, financial windfall we'll get from the hedge fund CEOs, but how we treat those that come behind us, the least among us. How do we lift them up by their bootstraps? How do we provide with them, for them the avenue to success? That's how we will be judged as a society in the future. Not necessarily by how wealthy we are, not necessarily by how, many, how your bank account is doing, but more so how your soul is doing. And so I hope that uh, this college remains on course in providing an avenue of uh, opportunities for many young people across the city of New York, uh, coming from different places of the world, from different uh, experiences with their families that choose to come to CUNY, the Harvard, the Yale of New York City, for a better future for their families. And I think you have been very successful. In fact, I am uh, encouraged to hear that very soon you will be breaking ground on your new nursing school facility and that you're still fighting very hard to get the funding to ensure that you will open up your new science building, which will transform this campus. And indeed, it will transform this borough. To have Lehman College become a hub for science, for technology, will provide opportunities for thousands of children, young people across this great borough and the city. And it will become, I think, the transmission to change, uh, bring about change economically in this borough. So these have been, as I said uh, earlier, an incredible first 100 days. Uh, to start this 115th Congress, uh, representing this very diverse district uh, that I hold very dear to my heart and that I was sworn in to support and uh, represent and to defend against enemies, both foreign and domestic. And so, and to bear true faith and allegiance to the same. This is an obligation that I hold dear to my heart and that I, I hope to continue to faithfully adhere to in Congress. And as I said earlier, I served in the Education and Workforce Committee as well as in the Foreign Affairs Committee and in the Small Business C Committee. The Foreign Affairs Committee stands also at, in the middle of a crucial debate about the future of our nation and the role that we should play in the international arena. Are we to become the policeman of the world, or are we to become the facilitator of peace across the planet? And that is the great debate within that particular committee, and whether we choose to use force, or we choose to be diplomats and exercise the talent of that particular arena. And so that is why I voted consistently uh, against the increase of military funding, because General Kelly himself said that if we got the funding for the foreign service, we will have to purchase more bullets. So one thing is joined at the hip with the other. If you back up, on your ability or your commitment to diplomacy, you will then have to arm yourself to a greater degree. 
and we will not be able to police the entire planet. It is unsustainable and inconceivable. And so we must continue to exercise the route of diplomacy and dialogue across the world to ensure that we have lasting peace. And so I am in two crucial committees, both the Foreign Affairs Committee, Foreign Affairs Committee, which is right in the middle of this great debate about what happens in Syria and what our role should be there. What happens with North Korea and what our role should be there. How do we go back to Latin America and the Caribbean and engage those countries that we have turned our backs on for far too long, our neighbors, in our backyard? How do we engage them in the international community so they can continue to be our friends and allies? How do we protect NATO? And how do we engage the European Union in a very positive, progressive discussion to ensure that it continues to be a thriving continent uh, that is committed to being our allies in the world arena. These are the great challenges before the Foreign Affairs Committee. The Education and Workforce Committee has its own challenges. The challenges of how do we protect men and women's rights to organize and be members of labor unions. How do we help uh, also students with student debt? How do we help colleges like this one have the necessary funding to ensure that they continue to move their agenda ahead? These are critical issues about the future of America. And the Small Business Committee, one that has also great challenges. You can go anywhere across the city of New York and you will see in any commercial strip, in any commercial artery, how small businesses are hemorrhaging, how they're shutting down their doors because of a lack of resources, how small businesses lack access to capital, how they must become modern and innovative and embrace new technology so they can be competitive. The small businesses that continue to be the greatest employers of our economy, not the great corporations, not the big chain stores that often benefit uh, by paying their workers a minimum wage, keeping them under the poverty level, and accessing uh, a program such as Medicaid, food stamps, Section 8, the social programs, by keeping their employers under the poverty levels. We, the taxpayers, have to subsidize Chain, score, uh, chain stores, fast uh, food stores for their workers' benefits package. You, the taxpayers, pay them. And so these are the great challenges that I face in those three committees. And in the last um, few months, we have been marked by numerous uh, challenges. Uh, first and foremost, we were uh, confronted by President Trump's executive orders. He chose to circumvent the legislative process. He chose to circumvent your ability to speak to your duly elected representatives, including your congressional members, about the issues that are of importance to you regarding immigration. And he fast-tracked his immigration policies through executive orders that were subsequently held unconstitutional by several courts, federal courts. This establishes that our nation is still healthy, that you cannot go govern as an emperor in isolation, that we have three branches of government that provide uh, to themselves checks and balances, including the judicial branch, that must be taken seriously. And it is in these cases that the judicial branch played a pivotal role in saying, wait a minute, stop there. These executive orders are unconstitutional. And you, the general public, play a pivotal role as you mobilize across the country in ensuring that those judges knew how you felt. So it is important that we continue to mobilize against the Muslim ban. 
It is important that we continue to mobilize against the initiatives uh, that President Trump tries to perpetrate against us with regards to immigration. And that includes a $1.2 billion increase for Homeland Security. Half of the funding that he's seeking, he's seeking $3 billion to give to Homeland Security to ensure that he puts into motion his deportation machine. And so I voted against the extension of the budget, although the budget had in it some worthy worthy projects, such as block grants for daycare. It had uh, funding for research from NIH, uh, very dear to me, as I represent a district that has perhaps some of the most important research uh, institutions in the world, Columbia University, Yeshiva University, uh, Lehman College, City College, uh, New York Presbyterian Hospital, Montefiore Hospital, Mount Sinai Hospital, the biggest employers in the district are in the health arena, and they are very critically and intricately connected to research. And so research funding, which often leads to additional funding from uh, the private sector, the state, and the municipal government, it is important, of uh, critical importance to this district and to the future of this nation. And what do we do in the area, uh, the area of science, which I know is an important part of the mission of this institution. So although those, the budget had uh, some provisions in it that were positive for those areas, I could not hold myself uh, receptive to the reality that I had $1.2 billion to uh, fund the deportation machine that President Trump uh, proposes to unleash on families. And that's why I've introduced two pieces of legislation that are critical. One is calling on ICE to wear body cameras. We feel that this is important. It will protect civilian rights and the agents themselves. And the other one, prohibiting them from entering into sensitive locations like funeral homes, churches, schools, emergency rooms, to interrogate and arrest uh, people in our country. And so these two pieces of legislation, I think, are contradictory to the tone that our president wants to establish. We've seen how uh, hate crimes have increased. We just saw recently how two incidents marked baseball on Fenway Park. And we continue to see these, these incidents play out again and again and again across our nation. And that's because our president is setting a negative tone, an intolerant tone, a tone of divisiveness, of scapegoating people. And that's not what a president should do. A president should be a, someone that uh, reconciliates differences, someone that's beyond reproach and above that petty rhetoric. And so we must continue to organize. We must continue to mobilize. And of course, the other major issue that has been thrust upon us in these first 100 days is that of the repeal and replacement of Obamacare. And I say Obamacare because some people are confused. And they think that Obamacare and ACA are two separate things. Some people say, I don't want Obamacare. I just want to make sure that I get the Affordable Care Act. They're the same thing. And so yesterday's vote, a very tough and deeply uh, divisive and, and deeply contested vote uh, shows that the White House is intending to dismantle and to replace with some other uh, system Obamacare, which I think is historic. Because if you look at it in its historical context, Obamacare was attempted by the Clintons and other administrations who unsuccessfully were able to accomplish this. And now the Republicans are, and President Trump are trying to uh, obtain the biggest transfer of wealth in the history of our nation from the rich 
from the poor to the rich. And so these changes on health care are not simply changes on health care provision. It is the, the biggest shift of wealth from middle class and poor Americans back to the rich to further, further catapult his tax reform efforts, which will be coming down the pipeline. And so I'm very concerned that what was approved yesterday at the House of Representatives proposes to do away and kick to the side, to the curb, pregnant women that are looking to seek maternity leave. It kicks to the side senior citizens that will be paying more for less. It kicks to the side people with pre-existing conditions. And it kicks to the side 24 million Americans, including 6.5 million Latinos, that now will be strapped without any substantive health care provision. So this is uh, an ongoing fight that now shifts to the Senate. And so we're looking at our Senate delegation and the Democratic caucus in the Senate to play a pivotal role in ensuring that this is not dismantled in a way that it will hurt millions of Americans. So uh, again, I'm counting on my colleagues there in the Senate, and Senator Schumer has been a strong, as well as Senator Gillibrand, strong advocates to keep the important provisions of this uh, initiative. But we see how even Republican senators are very concerned about how this particular initiative was fast-tracked without an assessment from the Congressional Budget Office that would have told us exactly how much it would cost and what kind of an impact it would have on the economy. 100 days into President Donald Trump's presidency, America has witnessed a dramatic shift on many fronts. But his first 100 days have been trouble. His two executive orders pushed back by the courts. General Flint had to step down for his aspiration Bannon had to step down from the National Security Council. They had to resort to the nuclear option to select their next Supreme Court justice. And just recently, finally, after two failed attempts, they were able to get uh, the ACA repeal and replace uh, bill out of the House of Representatives under great debate and great constraints and are still facing major hurdles in the Senate. So if you take a look at the entire scenario, I would say he gets an F for failure. So we must continue to organize across this country. Deep, deep inside of my soul, besides having been a state assembly member and a member of the state Senate and now the U.S. Congress, I'm an organizer at heart. And I know that when you organize people, when you organize communities, good things happen. And so the president's radical, now blocked executive orders have proven to be disasters for his administration. And I have been a vocal uh, opponent of them. My disagreement with President Trump's, Trump's uh, initiatives are well documented, but are proven in the votes that I have cast. And they, they are so, and I am so appalled by them because they are contradictory to my story, which is deeply and truly an American story. One of a young boy that came here at the age of nine uh, with, with his parents and his siblings to meet his grandparents who were both factory workers, having overstayed my visitor's visa, having to go back to the Dominican Republic to get my green car in the middle of a civil war. And now I'm a member of Congress. And I walk next to any congressional member whether they are from Mississippi or Alabama, and I could look at them straight in the eye and say, my vote is as good as yours. So this is an American story. <laughs> so our resistance to the policies of Trump, uh, that Trump has put forth, is important for working families, immigrant families, Muslims, and all communities that have been targeted by this hateful rhetoric that has been unleashed since the last election. 
Our unity displays the power of progressive allies, organizations, churches, community-based groups, the LGBT community, the labor unions. All of our allies have been committed to defeating this aggressive agenda that President Trump has put forward to attack immigrant families and other families around the nation. And so I'm thinking at this point of my own family, your family, our family, the New York family, and how they will be impacted by all these initiatives. We all know that New York City is over 50% either foreign-born residents or first-generation Americans. One out of two New Yorkers was either born in another country or is the son or daughter of someone that was born abroad. We are a very diverse city and perhaps that diversity is our strength. So these initiatives will have an impact, a tremendous impact on the daily lives of many New Yorkers. And I urge you again to continue to organize. Uh, let's find a common cause. Let's find a consensus to ensure that we can move together as a sanctuary city. And a sanctuary city is not one that harbors hardened criminal, as he has been attempted to be depicted. It is a city that allows a mom to take her son to school without the fear that the principal will turn her in. It is a city that allows a grandmother or a grandfather to go to the emergency room without the fear that the nurse is gonna call Homeland Security. It's a, the city of a, of a woman who can go to the local police precinct to report domestic violence. That's what a sanctuary city is. It is a safety net of support, of allegiance to the least among us. And so we must continue to fight for that because that's the soul of our city. That's not just an esoteric idea. That's not just a bureaucratic program. It is deeply embedded in the soul of our city. And we must continue to protect that. I was happy to see that no language was included in the extension of this budget to hurt the city financially because of our status as a, as a uh, city that harbors families, not criminals, that provides opportunities, not beats up on people. Uh, and so we're happy to see at, the, see at the very least that that did not happen. So I know that our work is not done yet. This is deep and very personal for me. This is the reason why I'm fighting in Congress. I would have um, preferred to enter Congress on the better situations, perhaps with a friend in the White House or even in our own majority. But God works in mysterious ways. And she has brought me to a scenario that I did not expect, but has allowed me to tell my story and has allowed me to say to the American people that we are a good people, one that believe in opportunities, one that believes in giving refugees an opportunity to come from all over the world, fleeing famine, war, economic disadvantage, one that allows families to be able to send their kids to college just like this one, so they could be the first college graduated members of their families and future members of the middle class. That is what our country stands for. And so I'm happy uh, to say that God works in mysterious ways and he has put me in that crossroad, right in the center I am not a philosopher. I leave that to others. I'm not even a good negotiator. I leave that to my staff. <laughs> but I'm a fighter. I, I believe that I'm a fighter from Washington Heights and God has allowed me to come to Washington at a critical time to fight for you. I want you to stay strong. I want you to stay firm. Keep the faith. Thank you so much.
Let's give our congressman another round of applause. I would like uh, now to thank our faculty, staff, and students, and the organizers that uh, put so much effort into this uh, Lehman Lecture. In particular, I want to uh, thank our good colleague, Chris Malone, for all his behind-the-scenes work to make sure that this was a great program. And I would now like to invite all of you to join us at the faculty dining room for a reception. Thank you very much.